<clears throat> good morning, good morning, angry fans. And you join me midway through the journey because I have completely rebooted my phone. It's on a final warning. It's drinking in the last chance saloon. If it cannot record this video without getting stuttering halfway through and getting the words out of coordination with the sound, then I don't know what I'm going to do. So I've completely rebooted it, I've put it in airplane mode, I've turned everything off, Bluetooth, everything. So we'll see how we go anyway. So anyway, you join me on a day of, and it's an exceptional day, it's an, I think the best way to describe it is an exceptional day. A day of exceptional stupidity in central government in which they've announced the plan to ban the sale of all new petrol and diesel cars by 2040. Now, Angry, why are you worried there, you might say? You are going to be 79, 81, whatever. At that point, you won't even be driving. And that is true. However, it's the government of the present day that's done this, and it's the government of the present day that's in charge of everything else about me that's present day. And therefore, their decisions on issues like this are an important quality indicator as to the, you know, the level of intelligence being employed in their decisions on other areas, such as dentistry. So why, Angry, have you particularly got the hump about this, because I have, I have got the hump about this. God, I don't know, I hope that's not politically incorrect. I don't even know what the hump is. <laughs> I don't know. I don't get in the hump. I don't know what it might be. I better shut up. Okay, right. So, this embodies all my pet peeves, which is big government stu and stupid government. Because What's happened is, and the population understands this, we understand this. Historians of the future, I am driving in a car, this is called a car, and it works by burning fossil fuels. And it actually works pretty well, you know, it goes from A to B, it's very reliable, and it, uh, it takes seconds to fill up, <laughs> to recharge. Now, in the future, it may well be that it only takes seconds to recharge a battery and a battery goes a thousand miles. Or you have your batteries swapped in and out or something, I don't know. But the point is that that technology doesn't exist yet. And that's an important factor to remember when, when considering the, the rest of this lunacy that's going on. So, we've had a massive great campaign against diesel cars. This is a diesel car. We were all encouraged to buy diesel cars. Diesel was seen very much as a byproduct of petrol refining, refining, and uh, you know, sort of, a, it was the second-class fuel. It was the fuel that you put in lorries and uh, uh, you know, buses and things like that because they they could afford to burn <laughs> second division fuel because they didn't need to go very fast, you know, uh, and they wanted something that was cheap because they were very ultra sensitive about their operating costs. If you're driving all day, every day, then you know a penny more or less on the cost of fuel uh, makes a big difference. And diesel was cheaper because it was like they had too much of it. They produced petrol, petrol uh, also produced diesel. Nobody really wanted diesel because the engines that used it were really slow and clunky and, and uh, presumably polluting. Well, anyway, Long come the uh, engine manufacturers and find a way to make diesel engines really move. And they do. I mean, you know, probably petrol cubic centiliter for centiliter is, you know, is more, has more energy, and a petrol car will always be faster than a diesel car. But this is a diesel car, and I tell you, it goes plenty fast enough for me. And, and I'm not, I'm no slouch, you know, it'll do anything up to including and over the speed limit on any road so uh, that's what that's all I ask so 
then then what happened was that diesel magically once we'd been all you know we'd all got accustomed to the fact that diesel was the cheap fuel and they brought out the good cars and we're all thinking that's good because you know if you've got an eye for a bargain and you don't mind uh, sounding like a taxi then um, you can get a car that uses cheap fuel and now, now all of a sudden diesel's expensive and that's because apparently nobody's making it anymore don't know why or how and and then uh, apparently it's uh, it chucks out micro particles which I'm sure it does um, you know someone has just come back from New Delhi I don't talk to me about subatomic particles in your lungs so I know that's not a good thing that is true but the, my point really is that the government tells you something's good one year, one decade, one part of your lifetime or your career and then you know quite brazenly turns around 10 years later and says no um, actually that that wasn't true what was cheap should now be expensive what was safe is now unsafe and so what they do in in making these pronouncements is first of all show that they don't really know anything they don't know anything it's, it's no, they ha have this great desire to show that they know everything or make people think that they know everything but they don't really know anything um, and they, they're making a ton of decisions which would be better off left to the market because the market is, is far better at deciding what the truth is in these sort of situations than any government and and then later they sort of turn around and say, you know, having distorted the market, having corrupted the the, the price discovery process, they then um, they then turn around and say, oh, so sorry, we got everything back to front. Now, the practicality of uh, banning the sale of petrol and diesel cars in the UK by 2040 is is on the face of it laughable. And the reason why it's happened like this is because someone in government, and I think it's probably someone like Michael Gove, has, has said, look, um, we would, in an ideal world, we would like to get petrol and diesel cars off the roads. In an ideal world. And so someone would have said to him, yeah, well, we don't live in an ideal world. You know, we're not... If we leave that to the market to do that, then it's going to take a long time. It might be a century. It might not happen in your lifetime. Well, of course, if you're in government and something's going to happen, you want it to happen in your lifetime, don't you? You don't want to just die thinking, oh, yeah, well, you know, people are going to appreciate my art after I'm dead. You want some recognition. So, so the thinking, and this is a common thinking across government. It's a, it's a substantive way that they think is that well, look let's nudge things along let's not wait for the market to decide when is the right time to do this let's not wait until uh, wind farms are cost effective and nuclear power stations are cost effective and uh, lithium is cheap cheap and plentiful let's let's make it that way <laughs> by giving it a nudge let's let's uh, bring in a law which is the only thing they can do and we'll change the world. I mean, after all, we're in government. What is our job if not to change the world? And by bringing in this law, which is it's going to shock everybody and it's going to be widely criticised and regarded as undoable because at the, under the present circumstances, it is undoable. But if people know that they have got to do it, you know, if it, if it, why did you do it? Because it was there, you know, it had to be done. <laughs> then what that's going to massively accelerate research and development and that's the problem the reason why all these things are uneconomic is because um, because there's no effort being put into making them economic you know and and the reason why two and two add up to four is because nobody's piling millions of pounds into trying to find out whether two and two could be made to equal five and and that's the the sort of the thinking is that and then you know of course the critics come back and say well look okay 
X, Y, and Z are impossible. That's you know what you've asked is not doable. The time frame is too short, and they and they laugh and they say, oh, oh yeah, well we knew you'd say that. You know we knew you we knew you'd say it was impossible. We knew you'd say that you can't possibly do it in the time frame. You know, oh year of little faith. Oh you know how short sighted are you? How how defeatist are you? You know let's let's do it. Let's go to the moon. <laughs> Well, I would look at the price of lithium. If the price of lithium stays the same, then it means that the market is giving the government the message that they think that it's a joke, this is a joke. Because if battery futures are gonna go up tremendously, if, uh, if they think that this is the start of a revolution, and if uh, lithium uh, price uh, goes up today then that's going to be a vote of confidence in the government if it stays the same then it's going to be a vote of no confidence in the government and if it goes and if it went up last week it'll be a sign that the government is, is corrupt and they leaked the news out to their mates in lithium commodity markets who bought it all and front run the announcement so look at the markets that's all I'd say but I you know I'm not at the moment, why don't I drive an electric? I'd love to have a Lexus. I could, I could drive a Lexus. I could, if you're in the city, and of course a lot of this is biased by city thinking, then you can drive a Nissan Leaf. You can leave it, you know, if you've got a, a little drive or a nice drive, you can have a charging point on it and you can keep your Leaf charged up. And if your wife wants to go up Tesco, like 10 miles each way, then she can go. That's great, and that's exactly what electric cars are, are good for and will be uh, used for. And you know, I mean, I've got a few problems with the government sort of subsidising the purchase of electric cars. I think they should be cost effective on their own. And I've got a few, you know, I mean, how when when the uptake of electric cars is enough, then private companies will roll out charging points. I don't know why the electricity will be free. I mean, it's not free. I'm paying for it. I'm paying for it. You're charging up your electric car for nothing. You're you're just leeching off of everybody else, aren't you? Who pays the cost of putting that point in and, and paying for the electricity? So nothing's free, you know. As uh, uh, David, what's his name, says in the Sunday Times, David Smith. You know, show me something. Show me anything. Is there such a thing? There's no such thing as a free lunch. He said. That's true. Your rights and freedoms uh, usually come uh, the result of somebody else losing their rights and freedoms, and more more frequently their money through tax. So <clears throat> it's it's just ridiculous, and it's going to take up a tremendous amount of time and money over the next few years in pursuit of a dream. You know, this is the classic dental contract. You know, we have a dream. Uh, of a way that things should work and it's a cargo cult that's what it boils down to the cargo a cargo cult was uh, originated in the Melanesian islands when the um, the islanders who hadn't had had pretty much no contact with the outside world suddenly saw the second world war being played out on their doorsteps and they saw bounty from above <laughs> tents food, fuel, cars just come falling out of the sky. Uh, you know, as the two of the world's most technically advanced nations conducted full-scale warfare. And they, um, you know, when it stopped, when it all ceased, they thought that the reason it had ceased was because they had ceased to do the things that caused it. And so what they did was they sort of parodied the military activity by, by building it. Its classic example is that you build an airstrip in the hope that if someone in the sky sees an airstrip and has a bunch of goods, they will, uh, a bunch of cargo, that they will land at your airstrip and bring you stuff. And that's where the word cargo cult came from. But it, it sort of typifies a an attitude that if you you know that if you create something in an idealistic way that that wealth and prosperity will follow and it's not 
you know, this is this sort of cargo cultish behaviour on behalf of in, in the dental profession, uh, at the Department of Health, and in the government as a whole, is just it's just laughable. You know, the the last dental contract was a cargo cult. It was it was an idea. It was it was brought about by a charismatic leader who appealed to a return to the values of the past, the evidence-based dentistry, and um, and uh, eschewed uh, market uh, reaction, market forces, in the hope that if he built a system that, uh, in anticipation of of it of receiving the, the bountiful wealth of oral health, that it would turn up, and it never did. The uh, the whole profession overflew the Cockroft airstrip into the private sector. Uh, anyway, I mean, and I I used to. I mean, we were in Harley Street, and that was just around the corner from um, Oxford Street. And Oxford Street, they uh, banned cars and uh, routed, thanks to the power of the Oxford Street Traders Association, on the general, uh, you know, the, the Greater London Council, or whatever it's called. Every bus route, every bus route, every feeder route from every part of London now goes down Oxford Street because they want everyone to get a chance to get to the shops, their shops. And so uh, the idea of, you know, and it's now one of the most polluted streets in the world because it's full of diesel engines and cars, which, you know, they said that they were going to ban. And occasionally you get a bus, a big old bus, and it is. It says, oh, this bus is powered by natural gas or uh, carbon dioxide or farts. I don't know what the hell, butane, they're going to, they, they, these buses are powered by. But they're, they are, I mean, <laughs> you think you think lithium batteries are bad when they blow up? You want to see what a butane bus looks like when it blows up? And there's only ever one of them. That's why they've got all this advertising all over the time. Yeah, we have. This is a butane bus. Did you know this is a butane bus reducing? Uh, you know, but they're not. Most of the buses aren't. They're not. They're all diesel. They're all, they're all just advertising buses, and they drive it up and down Oxford Street. They they drive it up to uh, Marble Arch, turn it around, drive it down to Tottenham Court Road, turn it around, and drive it back up to Marble Arch. Why can't, why can't they just let the market decide? The market will decide. The market will do a better job. Okay, am I, am I, I'm not gonna get rid of this, am I? Not. They're not gonna give me a scrappage for this old thing, are they? They're gonna, their mates will get the scrappage. Who'll get, I won't get the scrappage. Someone's watching this now and the government and saying that, that bloke there, make sure he doesn't get the scrappage because he doesn't, you know, he's not a friend of the government, that guy. You'd be right. Okay. Nice to talk to you. Talk tomorrow. Bye.